When we read these readings tonight, today, we say to ourselves, what horrible readings. It's really morbid, talking about the sun, moon, and clouds, and stars falling, tribulations of oh life. In the first reading today, we have the platform of what we are going to talk about, and there the prophet Daniel saw in vision the precoming of Christ. And he said, when the days will come, the prince will rise, mighty of the archangel. And, and he is the one who are going to settle things, and because we know that by the love of the trumpet and St. Paul's speak, the angels will come forth and they will separate the good from the bad. And the day we heard that those who have died, they will rise. Some they will rise for everlasting life with God, and some for horror and disgrace. And so, in the first reading, we have four elements, or four things that we have, each one of us has to go through, whether you like it or not. The first thing is that everyone who comes to this life has to come to an end. There is a beginning and an end. That means each one of us are going to face death. And then we are going to be judged. Judge accordingly of what we have done on the face of the earth. What God has given to you, he has expected in return and more. Thirdly, we are going to really have our own destination. If we have pleased God and give by His message, please God, we will be with God forever. <coughs> if we have discarded God's command and also His word and His message, please God, not. But we will be away from Him forever. So there are four things. Death, judgment, heaven, heaven. Those are the four things that each one of us are going to go through, whether you like it or not. And then we go in the gospel today and we find Jesus speaking about the same thing. After this tribulation, God will send his angels to collect from every four corners of the earth all his chosen ones. Those that then he say have escaped. Escape escape from those things of this world and escape because their name is written in the book of life and then he said that after this is done Jesus will take his place in heaven and all of us who are with him will be as will be assembled before him will be always but I'd like to focus on the second reading today because there is the hope of each one of us. The order to the Hebrews said that Christ become our high priest and victim on the altar of Calvary. He died for us all. So his death forgive our sin. And his rising give each one of us the hope of everlasting life. So there is, there is what all of us believe. And that began when Jesus was emulated on that cross, and from that tomb he, uh, he, he was risen. As we say in the beautiful vigil of Easter, the empty tomb. What are you looking? The angel said to Mary, to Magdala, the empty tomb. Here are the clothes. He is not there, he is risen. <coughs> Go tell his disciples. And so this is what is our hope. That Christ died for each one of us to take away our sin and he rides so that he will give us the hope. That like him, we who experience the physical death will do and do with him the eternal happiness. This is what we say in the Eucharistic prayer. We who have experience with him in death, we do experience with him life. 
My dear people, what is going to be our judgment? Because many times, many times, you know, we speak about the four things at the end, and we say, what are these? What, what, what is judgment? What are you going to be judged on? God is not going to tell you how many times you are telling, you know. He does not have a book. And you say, absent present, absent present. That's me and you to me, because we are limited. But God is going to put in front of you your whole life. In a split of a second, you will see your destination, you will see who you are, and you see whom you please in life. And it flashed like a light in front of you. And then, you will see that that judgment is going to be on what I am going to say to you. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was ill and in prison and you came to visit me. I was strange and homeless and you opened the doors for me. Whatever you have done to the least of my people, have done it to me. What you have neglected to do to my people, you have neglected to do it to me. When I really look at the strength of the parish, I don't ask my bookkeeper to tell me how much money I have in the bank. I see what my people do for each other how much they care for each other. There is one teacher at the back of the church today here, together with some of the other teachers in her school, has really shown me that love is not how much we talk it, but how much we put it into practice. Your husband loves you not because he steals arrows from the cemetery to give it to you, that's what husbands do. They pass the cemetery and teach, and that's what they do. They take a rose from there and they give it to the husband's wife. They are so cheap. <laughs> it's not how much they shower with you with roses, or how much they call you Han and write, baby, I love you. Your husband loves you when he puts his sleeves up and together with you share the burden of and that's what you people have done this past few weeks as I made the appeal to you. Many of you have carried that very heavy candidates and brought them to us. The students and the scouts have done the same. And today, if you look at that room that we have behind the organ here, you cannot even go through. It's all piled up. In fact, I'm going to ask you after Mass to do me a favor, and I will talk to you later about that. <clears throat> that is what a parish is all about. Caring for each other. And that is what your judgment is going to be about. That's God, God wants you to go to Mass, of course, but you go to Mass for yourself, not for God. You need God, God will take you. You need his blessings. You need to hear his message. You feed on him. So you go to match for you. It's like you go to the grocery, not because the, the, the grocery wants you to be there in the store, but because you need the goodies. Otherwise you don't have dinners. So you come here because you need God. But when you go and do from your very good will, things for others, there you show me how much you love God. This week, in the vestibule of the church, I installed to band two banners. And I wrote on one, as you come in, you come in to worship your God. You leave here to serve your neighbor. That is 
what you and I are called to do. This building has no meaning. If we come to sing the Alleluia with John, if we don't sing Alleluia in the miracle that we see out there, when God is putting in your hands all that he wants you to do, and you will multiply it with blessings, and you see by your own, your, own, your own eyes the miracle that God do, because you gave the first step to obey him. Last week, without not to give you a notice, because I received this as you receive it from a letter to the Star Herald, I appeal to you for our men and women of our own state and the shore who were hit horribly by Hurricane Katrina. And you, not only reach out in your pockets, but with love. You gave me, because I put the 1800 that you gave in the second collection, plus with them, we raised over $4,000. That is what it means to be Christian. Jesus did not ask us to build churches. This is a convenience for us. He said to us, what I have done to you, Let's go do it to one another. As I have loved you, you love others. He saw us hungry, he fed us. He saw us ill and we need healing, he healed us. He saw disturbed mothers and people who loved the loved ones, he was there for them. He reached out to those who are untouchable, the leopards, and he touched them. And he said to his disciples, from this the world comes to know you are my disciples, from the love you have for each other. And that love that we have for Jesus began by his pastor ministry. Because he said to us, there is no greater love than this, than one lay down his life for the one he loves. And for excellence, behind me, you have that turn on the cross. That is love. And that pastoral mystery, the dying and rising of Jesus, begins with each one of us in the waters of baptism. We immerse in that water and we die for our sinfulness and we rise from that water a new creation. We rise from that water to be Christ-like. And that is the time we encounter Christ. And through our life, continue to encounter Christ through sacraments and through the Holy Readings Scriptures. My dear people, our Holy Father has announced this year to be a year of faith. And the first word that comes from our Holy Father is we need to convert. We need to change. To sit here on Sunday morning, you are not doing your obligation for your faith. You don't even scratch the surface. He is saying to us to believe is to live what you believe. And if we look into ourselves, if we make evaluation of self, and compare ourselves how much close we are to Jesus, then it's much. We need to change in our life to become like him. And that's the first call of the Holy Father. To change our ways. To believe in the word of God, which is the scripture. <coughs> to be enhanced by the teaching of the church with the catechisms and also the councils of the church. And to be full of joy of this great pleasure that we have that we have been given the word and also a church that loves us like a mother and now he is sending us go now and teach your nations. Our Holy Father is not saying something that is uh, a new result. It's always the case. It's always was the preaching of the gospel. To know Christ and to make him known. 
And so the first part of the was is conversion. And that conversion does not begin because I say I want to change. You begin to change in the suffering of parents. They are the beginning of change. When you die to your pride, you know in front of someone who is like you and equal to you, and in him you see God, confess your sins and rise from the competitor to a, a new beginning. Rise now to live a life that is pleasing to God by avoiding all kinds of occasions of sin. Today, we have Brian and Megan who are offering their sixth child for baptism. And so they are pro at this, you know. <laughs> so what we ask them is that they have to realize that when they say yes to the priest at the beginning of the ceremony and even at the vows that they are going to recite, their word their words yes means that they take their responsibility very carefully. And they know they will. Because this child knows nothing of what's going on. But they take the, on themselves the responsibility to be the parents, the first teachers, to accept this invitation from God and to deepen the relationship with Jesus, setting the example in front of this child to call. If I ask you to say the names of the children, I don't know them by heart. <laughs> I call Duncan, I call this and this, I make so much, so much difference of their names. Because they have Irish names, of course, you know that? Your parties, I know. Beside the jokes, remember that this is a very special day for you, Megan, for you, Brian. That you are renewing again the vows of your own baptism, which is day in, day in, and they are life living. By denying sin from your life, Promise God to do the best you can in their life and world. You are the builders of tomorrow. You are the benefactors of tomorrow's church. And you are the one who sends these children to be citizens of this nation. I always believe with the council of teachers so beautifully. That faith does not begin in school. It begins from the cradle, around the table, around the kitchen stove, around the bed, around the house. The, ch the church teaches that the family is the domestic church. And we cannot avoid that. Every good thing begins in the family. And that's why we need to defend the family and defend it to the point that nothing and no one can take away those values away from us. We who are married, the first important task that, that we have is the love, the mutual love we have for each other. And that love that we have for each other set an example, set a more a role or a role, a role model for the children of God. What we do around the kitchen table or the dining table is the foundation of our faith. There we eat, there we share life, share laughter and hardship of the dead. And we break bread together from the hardship of those who work hard. And what we do there, we do it in a very special way at the order come together to share the story of Jesus, to be happy and singing those hymns that elevate and motivate our hearts and break bread with Jesus as we break his passage with us. And that's why young people today, even if they go to a day or school, they will never experience what takes place here if they don't experience home. You know, it is very important for parents today that they will really be vigilant about their children. But sometimes you do the best you can 
and you find one individual to destroy what you have built. And that's why you have to be very careful whom they associate themselves with. Their friends are to be selected. Although they are going to be angry at you because you forbid them that they mingle with these people, but you are taking a greater step because you don't want destruction of your child. We are living in a world today that is not very pleasant for parents. Young children today are being the targets of many of those who want money in their pockets, or even destroy other people's lives because they should destroy it. I'm talking about trafficking, I'm talking about alcohol, drugs, all kinds of other behaviors. And you have to set the goal by setting a moral example for them. That you will be a role model that they look up to. You are the one who are going to decide what school they go to. Give hundred percent, hundred percent in cooperation with teachers and principals. You cannot be against principal and by teachers because the benefactors of this education is your children. And so you have to be like this with them. Help them. Fundraise. Do the can you can. Because they want the best for your children. Be interested on those days of meditation as parents, with teachers. And try to be open dialogue with them. Because they want the best for your children. And finally, make sure that God will be the center of your life. Because if God is the center of your life, there reside peace and reside happiness. No one can give you what God only can give. As we say in that prayer, by whom goes with the prayer before we receive communion. We say that prayer in a very special way. You give us peace that the world cannot give, of course. But the world does not have the promises to carry. She promised, but she cannot fulfill. Only God can do. God is the center of your homes. If God is the center of our life, we don't have this massacre and this rage and this kind of behavior every time you turn, you turn the television. Because God is missing in the life of the man. And when there is no God, there is no love. There is no peace. I congratulate you, Brian. I, I hope and pray that although we don't need to be a parent, you will be the one to look back at the days when you're raising them up, when they are about to graduate and have their state of life, and you say to yourself, let's face it, we have done a good job. And to the parents, I hope and pray that you will work with them and help them in this endeavor. To the grandparents, congratulations today more, because today your children have a taste of the poison that you take.